really, really a pleasure to be invited to, to speak at this conference and really enjoyed yesterday. And um, so now, all jokes aside, you know, maybe a fish out of water, you may you initially see why are we listening to a zebrafish person? How is this relevant to the topic we talked about yesterday? Hopefully at the end of my talk, you'll understand where I think what we're doing might be able to contribute in these important areas. So before I start, I want to acknowledge some of the folks that I'm going to talk about uh, in three vignettes of examples today. So I have a large group, including um, students, postdocs, and, and my engineering team that, that's listed here. And, and two students in particular I'm going to highlight today are uh, uh, Lindsay Wilson and Yvonne Rorica. And um, they're going to graduate very soon, which is a sad day for me, of course. Um, but So their work. But I really want to acknowledge the important uh, support from NIEHS. and. Um, uh, like the, for particularly the RC4 grant during the uh, Recovery Act, that was so critical to put into place some of the instrumentation that, that we thought we needed to advance this field. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about briefly today, and I'm gonna zip through these vignettes, and you could ask questions um, with me um, afterwards or uh, by email. So some of the challenges in environmental health sciences, we, we heard some of them yesterday, and I'm gonna talk about the, the aspects of this field that we think we can contribute. So I'm going to give examples on how zebrafish data is actually filling important knowledge gaps uh, to make decisions. And the three vignettes I uh, decided to talk about are uh, putting biological context to, to uh, passive sampling studies. And then I'm going to talk about some of our work in, in PFAS, uh, and that'll be very short. And then, then a, a larger discussion about uh, how we're approaching this complex field of exposure to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And at the very end, if I have time, I'm going to talk about some of the kind of the cool instrument development that we put in together to really look at some of these adult consequences from developmental exposures to chemicals. And, and what you'll see from our talk is, uh, hopefully we, I, I'm not a, a fish person, I never was, right? I, I wanna answer these questions and I selected the fish model because I think it's the best model to answer the questions. Okay, so what, what are the challenges that we decided to, to focus on? We wanna make informed chemical decisions and we wanna make them faster. So Rick, Rick mentioned this yesterday. So a lot of the work that we do that I can't really talk about is we work with manufacturers of chemicals. So we had some great questions from some students in the audience yesterday. You know, why do we keep making bad decisions about chemicals? Um, honestly, in a lot of cases, there's regulatory reasons, right? They didn't have to test these compounds, but often it's because they don't have the tools to do so. So you tell them they should make them prove that they're safe, but they don't know how to do that. So we, we think we can help them and we are helping them. So I'm, I'm, even though we talked yesterday about we're trying to define what our exposures were, and, and Bob talked about this, and I think that's great, but we're not done discovering the chemicals that are related to adverse health com outcomes in humans, not even close. So if you really look at what we're in the targeted space, we're looking at the compounds that, that we've all been studying for 50 years. They may not be the most uh, important ones in terms of affecting uh, human health. That's, that's bad enough, but the fact that we're creating new compounds and mixtures of these compounds, we may be creating more problems than we're even worse than we're dealing with now. So how do we actually put the mission of NIEHS in, in front and center to be a preventative? Can we reduce the exposure to new compounds that may interact with biology? So what we wanna do is we wanna understand what chemicals have the intrinsic ability to interact with biology. You cannot have an adverse outcome without an interaction of the chemical with biology, right? So that's kind of obvious. There's no magic. There is no disconnect between toxicology and epidemiology, like we think there is sometimes. They're absolutely fundamentally related. And I think we talk about multidisciplinary research. We need, to, we need to think and work together more closely. And we want to know what is the structural basis for differential chemical activity? Why do we want to know that? Well, from a preventative point of view, you can design your way away from hazard, that's, that's obvious. And we can also start grouping chemicals based on the likelihood of an act, active activity. And then we wanna understand, so all that's on the chemical side. We're trying to look at the chemicals, and I'm gonna talk a lot about that today. But what chemicals then interact, and in, how do they actually interact with biology? This is now from the, from the biologic, biological point of view, looking back at the chemical, how did that outcome happen? The, the so-called mechanistic research. So finally, we wanna help this field become more predictive. Predictive of which chemicals that are identified in the exposome, which are likely to be related to an adverse outcome, not just their features in a, in a mass spectrum, 
but these are the compounds that we have biological evidence, they interact with biology, and they're hazardous. That is really seems obvious, but we're really not there yet. So just I put this as context. So if you look at the, this huge effort in, in uh, drug discovery and, and putting drugs to market, billion, multi-billion dollar industry, and we're, you know, we're shooting out about, at a good year, like 20, 20 compounds a year, right? So there's all this effort. They're targeting specific aspects of biology and of trying to avoid toxicity, all right? And that's very expensive. So now what we're trying to do in environmental health sciences is tackle this problem, right? There's 80,000 registered compounds. It's, it's infinitely worse than that because these are dynamic molecules in the environment. They're also dynamic in, in biology. So it's, it's really an infinite number of combinations of chemicals. Very few have been fully evaluated in vivo. Uh, mixtures, are, as we know, are very rarely evaluated. More than 60,000 of these compounds were introduced in sometimes large quantities without any testing at all, again, because they weren't required. And if that's not worse, there's more than 2,000 new compounds that are going in with the same uh, lack of, of testing. So certainly some of the acts, uh, the recent act, the Frank uh, Lauterberg Chemical Safety Act, is, might, might uh, uh, you know, address this if it ever gets fully implemented. But even if it does, it will take centuries, I'm not exaggerating, centuries to catch up or keep up with the new chemicals that are introduced. So clearly we have to approach it different, differently. So some of, the, some of the approaching, so we have a design criteria, I think about operationally. So we wanna do, uh, it has to, what, if we're gonna try to look at the chemical space in a large way, we want, it has to be relevant, has to be rapid, has to be scalable, and has to be rigorous. So again, I pick zebrafish because I think it meets these design criteria. So we could have approached it similar to like the ToxCast program where we develop a specific panel of, of chemicals, screens. So that means they're pre-screened. So this would mean you're screening on known biology. All right, we don't know all of biology. Just keep that in mind, right? So you could create all, all these panels of, of assays that I have described here. And then you could screen them one by one, this chemical, is or isn't active in this certain assay, and then you try to make a decision. But I really think this is non-tenable. It's limitless. The number of assays you could develop and the number of uh, combinations of chemicals. So, and it's also challenging interpreting. If you get a hit in these in vitro assays or a specific pathway, is it really an adverse outcome in an animal or, or a human? So that's a challenge that we're still grappling with in the field. So we, we, we do these assays, but we choose to do them downstream. So instead, what we try to do is we work with collaborators across the world. We want to source as many chemicals with as much chemical diversity as possible. We are, we're not going into it with a hypothesis at first. And we're going to throw it into a system that we think is ideally suited to interrogate the chemical. So we're using biology to interrogate the chemical. And in this case, I'll, I'll describe in a second, we're, we're going to try to sort out the chemicals that had the intrinsic ability to affect biology versus the ones that did not. And so the actives versus the inactives. So, so what, what system do we pick? So if you're going to ask this question, and you want, we, we heard yesterday about the importance of the windows of susceptibility. Certainly development is a window of susceptibility. There's a reason for that. Early development in, in vertebrates, including humans, they're generally more responsive to insult. It's because this is the most dynamic life stage of an organism. It's also when all the pathways are conserved between, say, fish, mice, humans, rats, et cetera. And most importantly, most of the genes in an organism, in any tissue, are used and expressed during development. That's why you're more susceptible. So when these chemicals come in during early life stages, they hit these biological targets, they disrupt their function, and there's a developmental consequence. So if you're gonna test for chemicals to know whether they interact with any biology, the best time to do it is during development. And so that's why we, we choose this system. And we're using zebrafish because uh, they're, they're small, and I'll show you in a second. So this is just to give you a, a, a time scale. So we're going from, from left to right. We start these exposures very early, single cell, just like the way we start in our development. And we're going we're gonna to go to the end at 120 hours. So we, we de develop instruments that could uh, remove the eggshell automatically, uh, in, had instruments that um, can put these embryos in multi-well plates. We have instruments that can automatically precisely dose across concentrations. We do broad concentration ranges, um, sometimes uh, four orders of magnitude uh, range of concentrations. We do 32 replicates at every single concentration. 
and these are all in vivo studies. We have, we have assays that we interrogate for the earliest neural behavior at 24 hours, and we, and we wait again and we look at 120 hours, we look at a couple other uh, neural behavioral outcomes, and then we look at developmental outcomes at 120 hours. So just looking at this scale, so all of the events that go between six hours and 120 hours in fish occur in humans. The same genes are used to accomplish it. The same cells are being involved, the same pathways. So we're interrogating really important biology at a scale unimaginable just a few years ago. So now I'm going to give an example. So that's our platform. We, we can screen lots of chemicals. Um, they're all blinded to us. A, a, a chemical is just a well, uh, wells to us. So this is in a collaboration with the Anderson Group, a part of our Superfund research program. So many of you know her, her um, invention of using passive sampling devices as these wearable wristbands, low technology, easily deployable. So it, it's, it's mimicking the bioavailable fraction of chemicals in one's environment. So she deployed these over a series of a few years across the world. And, and collected the data. So what she does, she collects these for, it's a, like a seven day uh, sampling on, on average. And then she brings it back to the lab and she uh, identifies what chemicals were in the environment near this, this, this person, these people. And so what she did is, so, so there's multiple content, uh, uh, the continents that were, were involved. And these are all, this is stage of her research is all targeted. So she has standards for all of these compounds. So she looked at uh, pHs, uh, phthalates, and uh, plasticizers, et cetera, flame retardants. And then we just said, okay, looking at all, you would expect the different geospatial uh, uh, location of these individuals, that these uh, chemical profiles would be very, very different. Again, this is target analysis. So first of all, what she found is there were some chemicals, regardless of where you lived in the world, they're very, very uh, commonly detected in these wristbands. So there's 14 of these that were detected in, in more than half of the, the personal uh, samples. So we, we, this is where we try to marry her work with what we do in the lab. So we, we got these individual compounds, we evaluated them in the zebrafish model in the way I showed you, and we did them uh, individually, we did them in the, the, the mixtures that they were present, and then we did some other mixture combinations. And this, this summarizes a ton of data. Uh, what you're looking at is, so 11 of the 14 chemicals were active in zebrafish. So this is a heat map. So wherever you see a gray box, that means the chemical across concentration and all those sensitive endpoints, nothing happened. Wherever you see a dark, um, a dark square filled in, uh, these are the, the endpoints are on the bottom, the, the purple, and are under the purple. And you can see we have endpoints at 24 hours and 120 hours. Wherever you see dark, that means we saw an adverse effect at a very low concentration and the lighter color means it took a higher concentration. So these chemicals are really active. So just operationalize this, and you know, some of these compounds um, are, are phthalates, we know, are phthalates, we know about these already. But imagine if we would have screened these compounds before they were introduced, right? That's possible now, and that's what we're doing with manufacturers. So th we identified these chemicals are really active developmentally, and, and many of these certainly we know this already. And at the, at the bottom, this global 14, this is a mixture of those compounds as if they, that one individual was exposed to all of these compounds. We do this across concentration. And then we also did the uh, equal molar mixtures, and then we use this benchmark concentration mixtures. So we can, we can recapitulate the, the effect of a mixture uh, based on the activities. So kind of broader, uh, certainly why is this important? You could actually prioritize some additional studies using this type of uh, data. Uh, we can identify the hazard of real, real world mixtures. This is what we do as our Superfund Center. We're deploying uh, and various um, uh, collaborators, uh, getting samples in the environment or actually uh, samples, create uh, mixtures from uh, exposomic uh, studies, for example. And we're trying to use um, non-target analysis, you know, feature detection, but we want to do that after the, the bioactivity. So use the biology to prioritize which fractions we should be focusing on so to make the life of the analytical chemist um, a lot easier. And then we want to, of course, what we're really interested in defining the mechanisms of action of these individual really active molecules. So all right, second vignette, so PFASs, so certainly we know that they're ubiquitous in the environment. They, some of them persist, not all of them. Some bioaccumulate, not all of them, and they are widely detected in, in samples. The problem is, is we really don't have a great understanding of the human health effects for all of these PFASs. And, and I think if there's a theme you get from this talk is chemical diversity, should, you should expect it to have different biological effects. 
So grouping chemicals accurately is really important or you're going to be um, uh, powering your studies incorrectly. So the idea is, first goal is to compare the toxicity in a single system. This may seem small, but when you try to do read across and try to make sense of tox data coming from all these different model systems, um, it's very difficult because you have that cross-species issue. But if we can get all the chemicals and systematically test them in a single system, we can directly compare them. So that's what we're trying to do here. And just look at the diversity of the chemicals in this space. Um, you would not expect these chemicals to all behave the same way. So when you do a, like a sigma uh, uh, PFAS and you want to say, are, these, are PFASs associated with an adverse health outcome? That's a dangerous way to go because you, you group chemicals that act differently. So, if, so understanding their activity and, and grouping could, could make it kind of like the PCB coplanar and the planar PCB as, a, as an example. And then what we want to do is we want to, if we can, can we then identify some structural triggers or structure activity relationships from this group of chemicals? So, uh, so Lisa Trong, who's in the audience, she, she directed this study where we got 139 uh, individual compounds from the US EPA, ran them through our assay, calculated um, benchmark concentration uh, values. And what you can see in that the Venn diagram is a lot of these compounds, only based about 50 of them, produce some effect. And the other ones did not. So this is right out of the gate. It's telling you these PFASs do not all behave the same way. And now we want to understand the structural basis for that. And so we're working on that in terms of some uh, chemoformatics uh, that I don't have time to talk about today. All right, so now I want to talk about, so we, I'm pretty confident that the phenotypic screening is valuable, but there's some, some and they're, they're valuable because they commonly occur. That we can easily measure them. Uh, they're very reproducible and they're very responsive to a diversity of chemical exposure. So we have very few blind spots for chemicals in this system. Disadvantages is they're, they're a blunt readout of activity. They rarely, they never really provide mechanistic insight. And you can have different initiating events produce the same endpoint. This is, this is not unique to zebrafish. This is what happens in humans as well. So what we wanted to know, can we use discovery transcriptomics as a way to provide another layer of information and help translate uh, across species? So again, just this is a screening outline again, but the key I want to talk about is we're, we're doing transcriptomics at a time point where there's no phenotype, but during the exposure paradigm. So we start exposures at six hours, the chemical is hitting biology in ways that we don't understand yet. We're sampling at 48 hours. We're looking at the transcriptomic pro profiles that are anchored to a phenotype that we're going to see three days later. So we're trying to get the early signals um, and we do a number, of, so, so that's important. So the concentration that we pick, we want to make sure we have a high signal uh, to noise ratio. We do this at an 80% level. So we expect that 80% of the animals in our exposure population are going to have a phenotype. We pick that concentration to increase our, our signal. So if we, th if we throw this, just showing the importance of another dimension in, in screening. So Yvonne um, uh, did this screen with uh, four PFASs that all have four carbon fluorine bonds with different head groups. So we hypothesized, we saw this in our data, that these are behaving differently. And for example, the one on the bottom, this uh, FBSA, this is, was very active, produced a, an adverse outcome at pretty low concentration, nice concentration response curve. The other three above, we saw nothing. We saw no, no adverse outcome, even though the exposures were the same as the, the one in the bottom. So we said, okay, can we use transcriptomics to, to sort this out? So again, we define what the EC80 concentration was for, for the FBSA, and we just picked that concentration for the other ones because we didn't have it a phenotype. And what we found is, for again, at 47 micromolar in this example, with the FBSA, massive gene expression changes. This, this chemical hit biology and perturbed a lot of it. And, and so we're chasing down these pathways. The other ones that produce no phenotype, even though the exposures were there, we even did body burdens, and we knew that at least one of them is almost the same level of, of uptake. The chemical didn't do anything. So just predicting uh, exposure to a PFAS doesn't mean you predicted an outcome. And this is gonna happen in a lot of the exposomic stuff. That, so we're gonna have to be able to sort out the stuff that matters. And like Bob mentioned yesterday, it may be um, sorting out the things that are associated with the things that matter, but that, that may be where we end up. All right, so now the last vignette I want to talk about is our work in pHs. So again, the theme is we're tackling lots of diversity of chemical space because we think it's important to sort them out. So uh, certainly uh, others in the room uh, focus on uh, pHs. Uh, there's thousands of these compounds. Their uh, main routes of exposure in human is in ingestion and, and um, inhalation. They're massively environmentally dynamic, so the chemicals that start 
in a smokestack or out of an uh, exhaust pipe are transformed over time. Um, so if you take a grab sample in the environment, you may have hundreds of different uh, pHs and they're substituted and very little toxicity data exists. So we're making um, risk assessment decisions over a handful of, of pHs based on carcinogenicity, but some of these other effects of the pHs um, are, are, are quite important. So we want to, we, can we use these systems to get a better understanding for understand the structural basis for activity? Uh, and again, using development uh, as the readout. So we did, again, we worked with Kim Anderson, and we, this is now a little bit old because we had, we're doubling the size of this right now, about 140 different pHs, uh, anywhere from two to seven rings with a diversity of, of substitutions on it. And we said, and again, these are all screened blindly by us. We just take them in, we run them through our assay, and we see what we see, and we unravel it later. Um, and so, so again, the readouts were all these morphological readouts that I talked about, the behavioral readouts, and then for these studies, we also did high throughput um, uh, immunohistochemistry to localize whether or not CYP1A is induced and where in the animal is induced. So this is a huge effort. And this is really, I know you can't read it, but you should be able to, even from the back row, understand that these compounds are not all behaving the same way. They've been treated the same way, but they're not behaving the same way. So in these category one on the top, these are very active. These kind of look like dioxin in terms of their effects on, on the biological system. So we're reading all the morphological readouts in the purple, and then the two behavioral readouts, and then the SIP expression pattern. And so what we did is we, we artificially grouped these based on different um, categories, anywhere, anywhere from one to eight. And, and so now what we think we can do is we can say, if we have a mixture that contains um, the ones, those are going to be free additive. And there's a potential for interactions for these other, other components, and we're working on that right now. So what we did to that level of transcriptomic data, we picked uh, two members from each one of those subgroups and did transcriptomics. And I'm not going to have a lot of time to talk about that. So we, they came out in two main clusters. Some behaved like cluster A, some in cluster B. And when we did the RNA sequencing, what we found is for that cluster B, there's a, a number of gene expression changes that are common. So these are these biomarkers that are, are, are common, but each one had some unique patterns. So they interacted with biology to perturb it in a different way. So we're doing this for other compounds, including other pHs. Can we start predicting the additive interactions of the transcriptomic responses between these pHs in a mixture? I think we're going to get there. Um, so this is kind of the main, main effort. Um, we identified a number of new biomarkers associated with the phenotypes. So these would be interesting in other systems. Um, so then the other, the other idea is this, the whole issue of, of dosimetry. Um, we're looking at increased uh, interest in using transcriptomic, transcriptomic data for risk assessment. So using the transcriptomic changes of gene expression as an adverse outcome. So can we identify the concentration where the gene expression change is, is linked at concentration to the phenotypes? So those might be the ones that are causally important. So that's what we try to do. So, so um, as an example, uh, routine is this uh, uh, pH that, we, that Kim Anderson identified first in the Portland Harbor at our Superfund site. But more importantly, it's widely, widely um, uh, um, increased in, after uh, forest fire, so wildfires. So this is a really important um, uh, pH that was a big focus of our Superfund right now. So these are being uh, deposited at Superfund sites, and they're also being uh, in air pollution. So we said, let's take a look at this pH because of its environmental relevance. It's toxic, um, similar to some of the other pHs. Concentration response curve, about the EC50 is around 16 micromolar. Um, if you knock out the H receptor, the molecular initiating event, if you're an AOP, -er, that this chemical doesn't do anything. So this is an HR dependent effect. So what Lindsay did is she said, well, let's, what, how does the transcriptomic profile um, uh, track with the phenotype? So she picked a bunch of concentrations where there were no phenotypes and keep increasing it till you hit the, the phenotypic uh, process. And, and let's just look at the gene expression changes. And again, again, we're looking at uh, 48 hours and, uh, from a phenotype that's not going to be observed until 120 hours. And what we found is that, not too surprisingly, at the lower concentration where there's no phenotype, we see very little transcriptomic changes. And as you get to this phenotypic concentration, you start seeing lots of gene expression changes. So, so the question at hand is, are the, is the phenotype produced because the magnitude of these, like the CYP1A, are higher at a higher concentration? Or is it truly because you've hit a tipping point and it's these new gene expression changes that are ones that are really important for, for the phenotypes? So this is what we're doing for our, our, a number of other chemicals. 
And then she did benchmark modeling, and we asked these questions about individual uh, gene expression changes and calculate their, their point of departure uh, in this whole animal system. And, and some of these really occur at very low concentrations. So these would be classic biomarkers of exposure because they occur before the phenotypes uh, develop. So we're, we're doing this for a, a number of other genes. So we think we're going to be able to do this for many different toxicants that have many different modes of action. And then we think we can roll this into um, predictivity based on uh, structure of, of compounds. And the last thing I want to talk about, and I'm running out of time, is, is and we heard a lot about this um, early, late life stage effects from exposures that may be you know, transgenerational, for example. Um, if you believe me that biology is conserved, then I can't think of a better system to interrogate whether or not in an early exposure in one generation might manifest itself in other generations. And again, it's, it's a, the scale at which you can do these studies. So we developed a number of new instruments um, and a whole new rooms to, to measure these later life stage and transgenerational responses. I don't have time to show the videos, but the, the, the operation that we use is we do our developmental exposures across concentration, identify the active molecules, pursue all the mechanisms of work that I talked about before, and then what we will go back to the really active ones and dial the concentration back to where we don't see any developmental effects. We do those exposures till the end of five days during development, and then we raise them in chemical-free water for 90 days, so we, there, there should have no more uh, new chemical added. And then we get them to adulthood, separate the males and females, and we run them through a whole panel of, of um, neural behavior and uh, fitness assays. So we could do respiration, we could put fish on a treadmill, and we can measure those studies. We have shuttle boxes that can assess uh, learning and memory in, in, in large scale in zebrafish. We can look at social interactions between fish, and many of you don't realize that fish are very social animals, so you can measure them. You just have to deal with the third dimension of water. Um, we can look at their fear responses uh, in response to developmental exposures, and we can look at their anxiety level. So these are types of tests that, we, that we're deploying um, uh, broadly. Okay, so to summarize, and we'll hopefully have time for questions, is uh, we, we continue to collaborate. We're open to collaboration. We're happy to. We work with the EPA, OECD, NTP, many commercial entities, et cetera. We're committed to uh, uh, fair uh, data sharing, so we're, we're um, very much in, um, involved in, in developing these platforms. We have all of our data that's stored locally, but we also have a database that we're working with David Reif at NC State, have been for over a decade. Um, to get our, our, our database completely accessible by the public. But in addition to that, we, we also have our, our portal, part of the data, uh, data supplements from the Superfund program. We created a portal that makes this completely accessible. All of our concentration response data, um, phenotypically driven, is at that, that link below. And with that, I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you.